Let's take our Bibles and let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, please. The 13th chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, I think for many, uh, this may be one of the favorite chapters in all of the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Uh, we have, since I think maybe the beginning of June, we've been preaching a series that we're calling the Great Chapters of the Bible. And I must tell you that I wanted to spend some time in Romans. And when I got into those chapters and into those uh, sections of scripture, I thought to myself, there is no way that we could do justice to these chapters with just a 30 minute, um, 35 minute, 40 minute, 40, <laughs> uh, 45 minute message. And so who knows, maybe the Lord will lead us back there at some point uh, to dive into the book of Romans uh, in greater detail. Uh, and so we're, we're skipping over that, not because there's no great chapters in the book of Romans. In fact, some of the greatest chapters in the Bible are in the book of Romans. Uh, but I just didn't feel like we would have the adequate ability uh, to uh, touch on those chapters. And so we have moved now to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. The title of the message this morning is The Greatest is Charity. The Greatest is charity. And it's a short chapter. It's only 13 verses. Why don't we read the whole thing? And then we'll preach the whole thing as well. We'll share some thoughts from this particular chapter this morning. The Bible says in verse number one, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let me ask you something. Where do you suppose you can find that kind of love in this world? There's only one place, and you're going to hear about it in just a minute, but that is quite a description, isn't it? of love that is given to us in these verses here in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse number eight, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now would you read this for final verse with me, verse number 13? Even if you don't have a Bible in front of you, you'll find the words here on the screen. And we'll do our best to pause at the punctuation marks as we move through this final verse. But let's read it together. The 13th verse of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Here we go. Ready? And now abideth faith hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Let's read it again, can we? I feel like we're just getting warmed up. And so let's try it again. Verse number 13. Would you read it with me? And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. You know, the church at Corinth was a an especially carnal, spiritually immature when, uh, church when Paul wrote this letter to them. We learn of that in the third chapter, verses 1 to 3. He says, listen, he says, I'd love to speak to you uh, in a more spiritual way, but because you're so carnal, I can't. I, I cannot... I cannot tell you some of the things that I want to tell you because uh, you have so much still to grow in and so much still to learn. As we read this book, we discover that they were immature in so many ways, but I'll highlight some of them. They lacked unity, according to chapter 3 and verse number 3. Uh, they took pride in the wrong things as a church. We learn of that in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Uh, this church was in the habit of abusing the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. We learn of that in chapter 11 verses 17 to 34 we talked about that just a little bit last Sunday evening before we as a church 
uh, observe the Lord's Supper. And they devalued those who were in their midst, who were a part of their fellowship, that maybe were less gifted than they were. Uh, we learn of that in chapter number 12, verse number 23. In other words, uh, those that maybe weren't as talented or maybe weren't as uh, gifted, whether spiritual gifts or otherwise, they sort of looked down on them. We don't need you as much. And Paul had to address that in this particular letter. And so suffice it to say, this is sort of a very, very broad look at this church at Corinth. But here's what we've come to understand. We've understand that the culture and the spirit of this church was broken and that it was in desperate need of repair. And yet, I want you to get a hold of this this morning because this is so key and so vital in helping all of us. In spite of these things, in spite of all of these things, Paul does not hesitate to refer to them in the first chapter and in the second verse, here's how he calls them. He calls them the church of God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So in no way, shape, or form does Paul or even does the Holy Ghost of God write off this church in spite of all of their issues, in spite of their immaturity, in spite of their inability to get along, in spite of their division, in spite of their uh, pride in, in things that they ought not to take pride in, in spite of their abuse of the Lord's table, the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, calls them the church of God, which is at Corinth. He refers to them as saints who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now let me just pause here for a moment. Let me just highlight as we get started in considering this particular church that you and I, we might find things wrong with a particular local church that maybe we have been a part of or maybe even some of you are sitting here today and you're looking around here and you're seeing things that maybe in your mind are, are, are out of sorts just a little bit or could use some improvement. And can I just remind you that we must be so very careful about condemning, about criticizing, and about burying a church that might have some aspects of a negative culture or a negative spirit. Maybe, maybe what we ought to do instead of, of heaping you know, dirt on the place and saying, you know, it's over, it can't be brought back, maybe what we ought to consider doing is instead say, Lord, you, you led me to be a part of this church, and maybe just maybe you you led me here so that I can help this church or any church that we might perceive that is broken or has a negative spirit or is dealing with some problems of immaturity within it. In other words, sometimes we're so quick, aren't we? We're so quick to say, you know, uh, this church is broken, this church has issues, this church has problems, and we're going we're gonna to look for another church somewhere else that maybe doesn't have all of these problems and all of these issues. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm sure, sure glad that not everybody handles things that way, because then that particular church would no longer exist. I'm thankful for some people who, who look at churches that might have issues and might have problems and say, you know, instead of me leaving, instead of me walking away, maybe just maybe God has led me to this place and I can be a part of the solution in getting this church back on track and back to where it needs to be. And I think to myself that in some respects that that's not just a problem we have as it relates to church and, and church life. But I feel like we as a, as a culture and as a society, we are so quick to run away from everything that we perceive as difficult or broken. I'm thinking to myself that a lot of people have that spirit as it relates to marriage. And, uh, you know, they, they find themselves in a rough patch and they begin to think to themselves, you know, life would be so much easier if I wasn't married to this person anymore. Life would be so much better if I didn't have to deal with this issue. And so as a result, rather than sticking around, rather than fighting for it, rather than getting the help that they need, and they just abandon the ship and they move on. I'm thinking to myself that others, perhaps it's not the realm of marriage, but maybe it's a financial mess that they find themselves in. Boy, it'd be so much easier if I could just, you know, if I could just get out of this mess. And so we're, we're, we're quick to run away from things. Uh, again, it, it might be a brokenness in any form, whatever it might look like. So many people are so quick to just abandon the thing and move on. Can I help you to understand? Listen, I'm not saying that there's never a time, that there is never a time to walk away from something. 
But I am saying that sometimes, listen, sometimes God has a work of restoration to do in the very place, in the very place that we assume is too far gone. And I believe that's what he was doing in the church at Corinth through the Holy Spirit instruction that is given in Paul's epistle. In other words, here, here's, here's the thinking. If this church would develop a tender heart and do what the Holy Spirit of God was instructing them to do, then listen, they could be useful and they could be impactful once again in their community and in their culture. Now, Paul had spent the previous paragraphs, before we get to chapter 13, he had spent the previous paragraphs writing about the spiritual gifts. And you'll read of that in chapter number 12. He spends quite a bit of time dealing with the spiritual gifts. And because this church was carnally minded, Paul acknowledged that this church would likely find themselves divided over who had which spiritual gift. And he talks about that quite a bit in chapter number 12. He speaks of it in verse number 18. He speaks of it in verses 21 to 23. And lastly, in verses 29 and 30. In other words, he is perceiving, the Holy Spirit of God is perceiving, knowing these people, that when they learn that there are certain spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit of God gives out, and because they're immature, because they're carnally minded, he, he makes the assumption, listen, I know what's going to happen, and those of you that might have a certain gift, you're going to lord over those who might, might not have that certain gift, and this could breed problems and issues and so he is addressing that before before it even happens knowing that it is a strong likelihood that it is going to happen so paul really is trying to in some respects with the 13th chapter he's trying to get out ahead of this potential division here's what he writes he writes that no matter what gift an individual might be given by the holy spirit of god now don't miss this there is something that is greater and that something that is greater is love Amen. or charity. Knowing that there is going to be uh, wars and, and fighting potentially among them because of their carnal, minds, carnal mindset and because of their immaturity, he is warning them. He is telling them, listen, I, I know how you think and I know how you perceive things. And I just want to remind you that there is something that is greater than these spiritual gifts that you might likely find yourself fighting over. Now, this is impactful. And here's why it's impactful, because, because the, the spiritual gifts, I have no control over what gift I am given. We're coming into a, we're coming into a gift giving and gift receiving season, aren't we? The truth of the matter is, is that, you know, you might receive a gift this year that you didn't necessarily ask for. That might happen. Maybe there will be someone who gives you a pair of socks that, you know, wasn't really something you had on your wish list. Maybe you wanted something else, or maybe, maybe it'll be a sweater. Maybe that, that, that grandmother, that grandfather will purchase a sweater for you that you don't necessarily would say that's my style, that's not what I would necessarily, maybe it's a necktie or, you know, whatever the case might be. You know, we don't have any control necessarily over the gifts that we are given, but listen, there is something that you have a control over as it relates to your spiritual gift, and that is not what gift you have, but how you use that particular gift. That, that you and I have a bit of control over, don't we? And so, and so you can lament what you don't have, and, and some certainly do, or, or you can grow in what it is that you do have. When you stop and consider what is available to all of us, that is love, you understand that Paul is saying, listen, that is greater than any spiritual gift will ever be. And because of that, one would be a fool not to seek to grow and develop more and more in this grace. So in other words, he's saying, listen, there are gifts, yes. But I want you to understand something. There's also grace. And grace will always supersede. It will always be better than the gifts. Because the grace is available to everyone. You may not have a certain spiritual gift, but you have within you the capacity to love and to develop and to grow, not just in your love, but in the love that Christ has. For the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Now, knowing these things and understanding that Paul is making the case that the grace of love is greater, is better than the gifts of the Spirit of God that are given, let's understand three clear statements that he makes in this particular chapter. I want you to see them. The first statement is found in verses 1 to 3. And here is the truth that Paul is teaching about the supremacy of love. Number one, he says this, we are nothing apart from love. 
verses one to three, it is abundantly clear. He is saying, listen, we are nothing apart from love. Now, everyone wants to be something or someone, don't they? Even, even believers can, can get, sort of get caught up in this, to, to be known and to be noticed and, and to be respected and to be loved and valued and admired uh, by many people uh, sometimes can become a great goal in our lives for people to know my name and for people to celebrate me and to congratulate me and to believe that I am making major, major contributions to this world and to this community and, 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 and to life in general. Believers can struggle with that. And when the church at Corinth learned that there was such a thing as the gift of tongues, oh, you can, you can, you can imagine that this church was, was, was caught up with this thought or this idea of being able to speak in, with the tongue of, of a man uh, or with the tongue of an angel. If I could have an opportunity uh, to be blessed, to be endowed with the gift of tongues, what a marvelous thing that would be. And yet Paul very clearly in verse number one says, listen, though I speak, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, you can have the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues, by the way, uh, in, in, in the New Testament context is not some gibberish that nobody knows about. It's not some unknown language, although, although it seems, by, by, based on the fact that he talks about the, the, the tongues of angels, that maybe there was some element of a heavenly language, the ability to communicate in a heavenly way. I don't want to necessarily get into that this morning, but I think if you study, and we talked about this recently, Acts chapter number two, boy, they had the ability to speak in tongues that they had never learned, but, but tongues in which other people were speaking in other places. That's what the gift of tongues primarily was. And I'm thinking to myself, what a marvelous thing it would be for that to be at our disposal today. I mean, how many times, how many times have you been in a place in which, you know, you meet someone and they don't speak English and you don't speak their language, whatever it might be. And, uh, and, and we look at one another and we make all different kinds of hand motions and we try to, I don't know if you ever noticed this, we try to speak louder as if that's going to help. Have you ever noticed that? I don't speak English. Well, Maybe if I yell at you, maybe you'll get what I'm trying to say. Sorry, it, it just doesn't work that way. Maybe we'll try to get closer. We'll try to be a little bit more demonstrative. And isn't that sort of a frustrating thing, that you cannot communicate with someone? And I'm thinking of our missionaries. We, we referenced some of them today. And I'm thinking, if you were to speak to them, they would tell you that there probably was a 12, 16, maybe even 18 month, maybe even two year period in which they were in some type of a classroom environment just so that they could learn the language so that they could go to the country and communicate effectively with the people. It's an incredible thing. And yet in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit of God came upon them and poured his power out upon them, they were able, listen, men who were unlearned and ignorant, these were not educated men, and they were immediately gifted with the ability to communicate in a language that they had never studied, that they had never spoken in, that they had never, had never learned in any way, shape, or form. That, my friends, is the gift of tongues, and what an advantage that would be to us today. But you know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, if you can do all of that, but you do it apart from love, you know what you're doing? You're just making a bunch of noise. You become sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Just a moment ago, we heard our orchestra play beautifully. They were on the same page, and they were on the same note, and we heard some of the brass instruments, and it's a beautiful sound. But you ever been around somebody who's playing a brass instrument, and they don't really know what they're doing? Or maybe, or maybe they're just making a lot of sound. Years ago, as boys, my parents wanted us to learn instruments. And, um, and of course, part of, that, part of that process was taking lessons once a week, and then also part of that process was practicing at home. I played the clarinet. My brother, my older brother played the saxophone and my younger brother played the piano. My mom had a bright idea that instead of you know, us all practicing at different times, we lived in a home that had three levels. One of us could practice on the top floor. One of us could practice on the middle floor. And one of us could practice in the basement all at the same time all playing different songs, all at different levels. Most of us not very good levels, I might add. We also, I forgot to tell you, we also had a dog in the home. So there were actually four sounds. There was me on my clarinet, 
There was my brother pounding out notes on his keyboard, on his piano, and there was my other brother blowing through his saxophone, and then there was the dog howling, moving from floor to floor. Where can I find some relief? <laughs> True story. I still remember it well to this day. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, you, you, if you have the gift of tongues, but you don't, you don't have any love, that's what you sound like. You're just making noise. You're, you're, and, and, it's, and it's not pleasant. It, it's, it's sounding brass and it's tinkling cymbal. It's, it's, really not, it's really not making any type of a sound other than uh, an annoying sound. It's, it's not helping anything. Why? Because we are nothing apart from love. Nothing. Well, then the church, then they were given an introduction to the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy during this time was to understand mysteries and knowledge, according to verse number two. Well, the carnal members in Corinth, they were captivated with the thought that they could have a gift that would help them explain mysteries, things that up until this point were unknown or unrevealed. They would have the ability to explain mysteries of religion that no one else knew. I mean, to know it all. <laughs> and then to be able to explain it all. For them, the thought of, hey, listen, I get to be the teacher and not the pupil or not the student, uh, to them was quite appealing as a Corinthian uh, individual, as a Corinthian Christian who was carnally minded and mature. But it didn't stop there. In verse number two, he expanded it just a little bit. And he talked about, uh, he talked about having faith. So we, talk, we, we see in verse number two, though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and that I, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Now you must know, you must know that when the church at Corinth, when those believers, as spiritually immature as they were, when they heard that Jesus made a statement in his ministry, that, that there, was a, there was a certain faith that could move mountains, boy, they latched on to that one. Tell me more about a faith that can move mountains. Jesus said it, didn't he? Mark 11, 22 and 23. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Well, you tell a person who is spiritually immature and is carnally minded that they can have that kind of faith, potentially? And boy, they grab hold of that. That is something fascinating to them. For the members of the church at Corinth, it was one thing to speak in an unknown tongue, but faith, faith that could move mountains, the ability to prophesy so that I could understand all mysteries and all knowledge and be able to teach those things and explain those things and allow people to see things that they'd never seen before and never heard before. Oh, that was, that was something else altogether. And Paul reminded them, didn't he, that even these Prophecy, knowledge, and faith, apart from love, were nothing. Finally, he addressed giving, doesn't he? In verse number three. Is there anyone more admired than the great philanthropists who give great sums of their wealth away in order to feed and clothe and take care of others? Perhaps you have driven down Interstate 71 heading into into town recently and you've noticed that there is a new building that is being constructed. The new building is the new campus of the Metro Health Hospital system and it rises there into the sky and you can see it. It's very close, in my understanding, it's very close to opening. Several months ago I noticed as they were building that that they put a sign on the building and the sign uh, referred to it as the Glick Center uh, for Health. And I got to thinking about that just a little bit. Who are the Glicks, and how in the world did they get their name on the side of that building? I mean, I wouldn't mind there being a Folger Center for health, or, you know, with my luck, I, it won't be much. But, uh, but maybe, I'll, maybe I'll get a story or two. The Glicks, they got a whole lot more than that. So I did a little bit of research. Bob and Joanne Glick were the founders of the successful national retail store known as Dots. Uh, I think I remember walking into a Dots many, many years ago. It's been a long time. Uh, so I don't know what's become of Dots, but at one time it was a successful store. They sold that company in 2011. And, uh, and, and they had run it for 35 years and they'd been pretty successful at it. Uh, they're Northeast Ohioans. They live here in this area. And so after researching how they would like to invest some of their funds um, to make, try to make a difference here in the, 
in the community, they decided to make the largest gift ever in the 183-year history of Metro Health. They gave, Bob and Joanne Glick gave, on December 1st, 2019, they gave $42 million to Metro Health. So, uh, that's why I said I might get a story. I might even get a room, maybe, if I'm lucky. But that's about the extent of it. I'm certainly not going to get a whole building. I'm not going to get a new hospital named after me. $42 million is the asking price. In honor of this, now think about this, in honor of this generous gift, Metro Health has announced that their new main campus being currently constructed will be named the Metro Health Glick Center. Long after Bob and Joanne are gone, I don't know who they are, other than just the brief summary I found online. I don't know much about them. I don't know what they look like. But listen, all of us know their name, don't we? Why? Because of this very, very generous, a very kind donation that was made to Metro Health Hospitals. Now listen, those who impact through their giving whether it be financial or, fig- or physical, they're, they're remembered, aren't they? Often their names are etched in marble for all of history to know. I mean, who, who among us wouldn't want to be spoken of favorably long after we depart this earth? I think we all have a certain fear, don't we, that in death, our fear is that we might be forgotten, that no one would remember us. And so the advantage or the appeal of having a building or a, or a home or, 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 or something named after us, some society or some organization that bears our name because we started, that, that's so appealing to us. But here's what Paul writes. Paul writes, you can give it all away. You can be known, remembered, and revered. Listen, if you don't really have love, it's nothing. It's nothing. Here, here's, here's the point he's trying to make. It's not who you know. It's, it's not what you know. It's not even what you can do or, or even what awards and accomplishments you might have achieved. What really matters in this life is how you loved. We are inclined, aren't we, to love ourselves? This comes to us quite naturally. To love God and to love others does, does not come to us nearly as naturally. In fact, this is something that we must grow in intentionally. This is something that we must work at if we're going to be successful at it. But because, listen, because we're, we're nothing apart from love, here's the takeaway that every one of us walk away from here saying, Lord, Lord, would you help me to grow in this area? Would you help me to love you more? Would you help me to love your word more? Would you help me to love your church more? And would you love, help me to love others more? You see, you don't need to come to this altar and fall down on your face and say, Lord, would you help me to love me more? There's not a person in this. I know the world likes to talk about growth and self-love, and you just don't see yourself in the right way. No, listen, the problem with all of us is we do see too much of ourselves. That's not an issue. There's not a person, you, you, you might say, you know, Pastor Pete, I, I walked in here with low self-esteem. I walked in here hanging my head. I, I didn't want to look at anybody. I didn't want any look, anybody to look at me. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, listen, what you, don't, what you need is not more self-love. You need more love for Christ. You need, need, need more love for his word. You need more love for his church. And you need more love for others, including the lost who are outside of this church. That's what you need more of. And without it, you're nothing. And I am nothing. The greatest gifts cannot compensate for someone who lacks love. But notice there's another great statement that he makes about love. It's not only we're nothing apart from love, but notice, notice the second statement that we find in verses four to seven. You know what I discovered as I was studying this? Here's what I discovered Paul is saying. He's saying this, that love looks like Jesus. True love, you know what it looks like? It looks like him. It looks like Jesus. Remember as we were reading that statement, all those statements of what real love looks like, and I asked you this question, where are you going to find that in this world? You're going to, you're going to find that? You're going to find that somewhere else apart from Christ? No chance. Look at the descriptions again, beginning in verse number four. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Listen, listen, you find the couple that has been married the longest in this room, that are the most committed to one another, and you will, you will have to admit, they would have to admit, that there have been times in which their charity did not suffer long. There have been times in which their charity, their love for one another was easily provoked. 
There have been times in which their love for one another did not, did not think the, the best of a person, but actually thought the worst of the person that they were married to. That's, that's the, the most committed couple among us. Why? Because this love that is described for us in verses 4 to 7 is not a human love. This is a godly love. This love looks like Jesus. Now, why is that significant? Why is that important? Well, number one, because the goal of the Christ follower is to be like Christ. That's why this is so important, because the goal of the Christ follower is to be like Christ. You know, the Bible tells us in Acts 11 and verse number 26 that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, most believe that this was intended to be a term of derision, that, that they didn't necessarily give themselves this term, but that their enemies or those who are not Christ followers, that they sort of, in a mocking, sneering, um, derisive way, gave them this term. Well, you're, you're just a bunch of Christians. It means little Christs. Um, but, but you can understand that they, they eagerly embraced this name because it connected them with their master. So, throughout history, there have been different groups of people who have followed a certain teacher, a certain leader, and they become known as, as, as that, by that name. Uh, for instance, the followers of Plato, uh, they were called Platonists, and the followers of Pythagoras were known as Pythagoreans. Uh, the followers, just as, as that was the case, the followers of Christ, they embraced the title of Christian because his name was a part of their name or a part of their title. In the church at Corinth, there were some who wished to be identified with Paul and others who wished to be identified with Peter and others who wished to be identified with Apollos. And Paul took great care uh, to crush this party spirit among them. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 13. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I of Apollos and I of Cephas, who is, who is who's also Peter, and I of Christ. And then he says this, is Christ divided? And then he asks this question, was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? You know what he's saying? He, he's saying, listen, it's not about me. I had nothing to do with your salvation other than just proclaim the truth of the gospel to you. If you're saved today, you're saved because Jesus was crucified for you. If you've been scripturally baptized, you were baptized not in the name of your pastor, not in the name of some great apostle or writer of scripture as great of a man as they might have been. No, listen, you and I, if we're scripturally baptized, we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's all about him. And as Christians, as Christ followers, the goal is to be like Christ. So if you're a believer here this morning, well, then you have been saved through the suffering, through the shed blood, through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's what saves an individual. Our blessed hope is that he is coming again. We will see him, and we will spend eternity with him. He has told us if we love him, then we should keep his commandments, and that his commandments are not grievous to those of us who love him. So the goal in the Christian life, it's never growth. It's never accolades or some reward. The goal of God, listen, this, is, this, this may not be the goal of people, but the goal of God uh, in, in the Christian life for every believer, for every disciple is this, Christ-likeness. That's the goal. Well, listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 29. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to what? To the image of his son. You know why God saved you? God saved you so that he could conform you to the image of his son. So that, so that, you know, years ago, God sent Jesus into this world, and there was one Jesus walking around here. But you know what God's plan was? God's plan was that we would, we would embrace him by faith, that we would love him, that we would grow in him, so that there wouldn't just be one Jesus walking around, but there, there would be hundreds of thousands of people that reflect his image, that are conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So why is it important for us to have this kind of love shed abroad in our hearts, for us to demonstrate and to exhibit this kind of love? Why is that important? Because the goal of the Christ follower is to be like Christ. And that's, that's what this is like. Because there's not a man or woman who can produce the love that is described in verses 4 to 7. It is impossible. It can't be done. Notice the second thought that we discover is that 
this, that we never, listen, we never look more like Jesus than when we show love. We never look more, now there's a lot of people who think they never look more like Jesus than when they're turning over tables and driving people out with a whip. And that, that's, that, that appeals to them, that power and that authority to walk in and to, and, and to, and to clear table. But I want you to know something, listen, you never, you'll never look more like Jesus than when you show love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's all about love. The Bible tells us that God is love. Paul wrote that love was patient, it's kind, love is content, it's humble, it's of good behavior, it's not self-willed or focused, it's not easily provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in evil, but it rejoices in truth, that it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And can I just, can I just gently remind you that Jesus Christ is all of these things. Amen. He's all of these things. You will, as you study verses four to seven, you will find that after every comma, if you'll pause for a moment and you'll think to yourself, okay, okay, the Bible says that charity suffereth long. That's Jesus. Jesus is patient, isn't he? The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. You'll think to yourself, well, love is kind. Well, so is Jesus. Jesus is kind. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You want to know what kindness looks like? Look at Christ, and you'll find kindness. Christ is humble, isn't he? The Bible says that charity seeketh not her own, vaunteth not herself, is not easily puffed up. The Bible says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Bible says that charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Christ never behaved himself unseemly, did he? Christ is good in every way. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. First Peter writes, Peter writes in First Peter that there was no sin found in him, there was no guile found in his mouth, no deceit. No dishonesty. He was good. Skip down to the end of verse number seven. It says about charity that it endureth all things. And I got to thinking to myself that Christ endured all things, didn't he? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, two and three, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So what do we discover in this great chapter? We discover we're nothing apart from love. We discover that love looks an awful lot like Jesus. And thirdly, we discover in verses 18, 8, 8 through 13 that love never fails. Love never fails. Ted Stallard undoubtedly qualifies as one of the least. The Bible talks about the least of these, my brethren. You've loved, you've done it to the least of these, my brethren. You've done it to me. Ted was one of the least. He was turned off by school. He was very sloppy in his appearance. He was expressionless. He was unattractive. Even his teacher in grade school, Miss Thompson, enjoyed bearing down her red pen as she placed X's beside his many wrong answers. Oh my, but if only she had studied his records more carefully, she would have discovered some things about Young little Ted. First grade, the notes were made about him, and here's what the teacher wrote. Ted shows promise with his work and attitude, but he has a poor home situation. In second grade, the teacher wrote, Ted could do better. Mother seriously ill, receives a little help from home. In third grade, the next teacher read, wrote this about Ted. Ted is a good boy, but too serious. He is a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Ted is very slow, but well-behaved. His father shows no interest whatsoever. Christmas arrived. The children piled elaborately wrapped gifts on their teacher's desk. Ted brought one too. It was wrapped in brown paper and held together with scotch tape. Miss Thompson opened each gift as the children crowded around to watch. And out of Ted's package, 
fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half of the stones missing, and a bottle of cheap perfume gently used. The children began to snicker, but she silenced them by splashing some of the perfume on her wrist and letting them smell it. She put the bracelet on too. At day's end, after the other children had left, Ted came by the teacher's desk and said, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And the bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presence. He left. Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her and to change her attitude. The next day, the children were greeted by a reformed teacher, one committed to loving each of them, especially the slow ones, especially Ted. Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, Ted began to show great improvement. He actually caught up with most of the students and even passed a few by. Time came and went. Miss Thompson heard nothing from Ted for a long time. Then one day she received this note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be first to know. I'll be graduating second in my class. Love, Ted. Four years later, another note arrived. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Ted. And four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stallard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact. I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Miss Thompson attended that wedding and sat where Ted's mother would have sat. The compassion she had shown, that young man entitled her to that privilege. Charity never fails. Here's what you need to know about charity. It will always be useful. It'll always be useful. Because he had compared love with these other gifts and, and elevated love above them, it was necessary for him to explain in further detail why love was superior See, they didn't know it yet. The believers in Corinth didn't know it yet, but, but, but eventually prophecies would fail. Not, not what had been prophesied, but the ability to prophesy would be done away with. They didn't know this yet, but tongues would eventually cease. A day was coming, a day that you and I are now living in, when the ability to speak fluently in a tongue you've never learned or spoken would be done away with. Knowledge, some refer to this as a word of knowledge, that would vanish away too. You see, during Paul's day, with the word of God still incomplete, not, not completely written in its, in, its, in its present form, it was not uncommon at all for a spirit-filled man to teach or to preach with a word of knowledge. In other words, a message that was divinely inspired by God because they didn't have God's complete, completed revelation, God's completed word in front of them. So there were times in which someone would stand and they would prophesy a word of knowledge that, that God had, had really spoken through them. But, but they were given to understand through Paul's writing that the day was coming in which these things would cease. But you know what would never go away? The need for love. It'll always be useful. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily need the ability to speak in tongues today. God's word has been given. What we need to do is we need to translate God's word into every language. That's what we need to do. That'd be the most effective thing that we can do. But you know, I, 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 can, I can learn and I can, I, I can set, set, set in my heart to go in that direction. But here's, here's, what, I, here's what I always need. I always need love. Listen, I don't, I, don't need, I don't need the Holy Spirit of God to communicate something to you that you don't already know. If you'll take this book and you'll read it, God will speak to your heart just as he speaks to mine. Now, you need to be here. There's something God does through preaching, but he does not divinely speak through me. You understand that, right? He speaks through his word, and if I'm just faithful to preach his word, then God's going to speak through that. But listen, listen, I will always, I will always need to show love. It will always be useful and impactful. The day was coming when all the spiritual gifts will be completely unnecessary. When is that day? It's, it's coming in God's kingdom can I say that love will always be key and central in that place? The Bible tells us that God is love. It does not tell us that God is administration or that God is service or that God is faith or that God is a word of knowledge. No, God is love. Therefore, love will always be useful. But notice, secondly, love not only will always be useful, but love will always be attractive. It will always be attractive. There are some who've developed a hard heart, haven't they? 
toward the things of God, toward God's word. I guess what I'm saying is, listen, try as you might, there are some people that you know who will never darken the door of this church. And you'll invite them every, every time we have a special Sunday, and even sometimes in which we're not, because you'll just have a burden for that particular person. But I just tell you that they're probably never going to come. And, and I'll just be honest, there, there are some people that don't want to hear a message. They don't want to receive a gospel track. So what can we do? How, how, can, we, how can we show them who God is? How can we show them that we're not, we're not evil people, that we're not, we're not trying to, uh, to, to destroy their lives and destroy their world? What, what can we do to make ourselves attractive? Well, I know what we can do. We can show them love. In Chicago, a few years ago, a little boy attended a Sunday school. D.L. Moody told the story. He said he, told the, he said he attended a Sunday school that I know of, and when his parents moved to another part of the city, the little fellow still attended the same Sunday school, although it meant a long, tiresome walk each way. A friend asked him why he went so far and told him that there were plenty of other churches just as good nearer his home. The little boy replied, they may be as good for others, but not for me. The friend asked, why not? To which the boy replied, because they know how to love a fellow over there. D.L. Moody would follow up this story by giving this statement, if only we could make the world believe that we loved them, there would be fewer empty churches and a smaller proportion of our population who never darken a church door. Let love replace duty in our church relations, and the world will soon be evangelized. Why do you do what you do for the Lord? Some of you sang in the choir this morning. Did you do it because, well, I signed up to do it, so I sort of have to be there? Why did you serve in the nursery last week? Did you do it because, well, somebody asked me and I didn't have the heart to tell them no? Some of you rode on a church bus today. And you picked up boys like little Ted we talked about a minute ago. Why do you do it? Some of you'd say, well, you know, I, I, I used to really like it. I don't like it as much anymore as I've gotten older, but I, I don't know that anybody would take my place, and so I just continue doing it. Hey, if we could rediscover, if we could rediscover a heart of love, hey, why don't I just make that personal? Why am I standing up here today? Am I standing up here because it's my job? Am I standing up here because if I don't, nobody else will? <laughs> or am I standing up here because I love God and I love his word? And I love you all. And I just want to be faithful to him. You get the difference, right? Let love replace duty. And our churches would be different places. As we raise our children, as we minister to our spouses, as we minister to one another, and as we minister to the Lord, may love replace duty. Why? Because love will always be useful. And love will always be attractive. Our heads